Coming up on DTNS, a project to make smart home gear interoperable, security certification for VPNs, and Apple Music pays more than Spotify. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, April 16th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Also from Los Angeles, I'm Lamar Wilson. Drawing the top, top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Jane. We were just talking about who among us has and has not had their picture taken with a chimp. If you want to find out, uh, get our expanded <laughs> show, Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Microsoft introduced a kids mode for its Edge browser with two modes for kids aged 5 to 8 and 9 to 12. Kids Mode features a unique home screen with news stories from kid-friendly publications and includes a built-in list of approved sites that parents can customize. So it's a blunted edge. No. Okay. Bitcoin was down more than 4% on Friday after Turkey's central bank banned cryptocurrency and crypto asset purchases for goods and services due to possible irreparable damage and transaction risks. Ethereum and XRP, which tend to follow Bitcoin prices trends, fell between 6 to 12%. Turkey's main opposition party criticized the ban. Google added a new shortcut to the desktop version of Google.com, so pressing the slash or forward slash will now jump to the search box when viewing results. This is seemingly designed to speed refining an original search query. The Google Project Zero security team updated its vulnerability disclosure policies. They've added an additional 30 days after a patch is issued to bug disclosures. That's meant to give end users additional time to secure their systems, including for zero-day exploits. Previously, Project Zero published details after a bug after 90 days or when a patch was released, whichever came first. A team of researchers from QTech in the Netherlands published an article in Science describing a proof of principle demonstration of key quantum network protocols, successfully creating the first multi-node quantum network using three quantum processors. Direct physical links have previously been established between two quantum processors, but this is the first to connect two quantum processors through an intermediate node and establishing shared entanglement between multiple standalone quantum processors. Man, the Dutch good at quantum stuff, and as we'll find yes. out later, vertical farming. And cheese. Uh, and oh, cheese. Yeah, and shoes. All right, let's, let's talk a little more <laughs> about music, royalties. Uh, in a letter to artists sent through the Apple Music dashboard, Apple claims to pay music rights holders one cent per stream. That's compared to Spotify's recently disclosed rates of between one third and one half of one cent per stream. So, you know, one cent per stream all of a sudden looks pretty good. Apple also said 52 cents of every dollar of revenue goes to labels, while Spotify claims 50 to 53 cents. The Wall Street Journal points out, though, that Spotify pays less per stream because its customers listen to more music per month than customers on other services. Spotify also has free ad-supported tiers that generate less revenue than the paid subscription tier. Apple also said in its letter that, quote, creators should never have to pay for featuring, end quote, music in prime display space. Yeah, I thought this was interesting. Uh Partly because uh, a penny sounds like a lot more than I would have guessed, even even if it is getting uh, split up between the labels and, and the musicians. And the musicians obviously always get a little bit less. Uh, labels keep a lot of that. Uh, that, you know, per stream, again, think about the, you know, millions of streams that happen. Amounts uh, of stream, yeah. Yeah, that's a decent amount of money sloshing around there. It's more money than I make on, on YouTube. I need to make an album. You know, let, let's, let's, let's do it. <laughs> Like, yeah, become a successful recording artist, Lamar, and you're good to go. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. am, I am ready. I'm ready it's, now. It's not that hard. People do it all the time. Uh, I was also fascinated by this, this idea that Spotify ends up paying artists less because their listeners stream more music. Uh, that is a an aspect of this system that I think needs addressing, which is if, yeah. you're, if your listener is a bigger fan of music, they're going to benefit the musicians less. And if you're like, wait, why is that? Uh, mm -hmm. Remember, you're you're paying $10 a month for the service, right? So if you listen to 10 streams that month, then your $10 is split up a dollar per stream. But if you listen to 100 streams, then it's only a cent per stream. And if you listen to 1,000 streams, it's even less. So imagine that same calculation spread out across the entire audience 
of Spotify. And the fact that Spotify listeners just tend to listen to more songs in a month than Apple Music means artists make less money per stream. Yeah, so yeah well, because Spotify punished, isn't right? going to say, oh, Tom Merritt, you know, he's he's our best customer. He's never not listening to Spotify. We just won't take our cut you know, yeah, to give right. the artists more. It's like Spotify is going to take their cut no matter how much you're using a service in Apple Music, too. I mean, it's that's that's why they exist. And there's so and you're only is, paying the same amount every month, no matter how much you stream. So, you know, exactly. That's it. Yeah. Gosh, can you imagine a music streaming service data caps? Oh, that's interesting. Oh. Oh. Yeah, don't don't think about this too much, Spotify. Just, just back <laughs> off. Right. Yeah, don't forget I said it. Yeah, no kidding. Because I mean, man, if Comcast and Spectrum ran music services, you you know you that's, know you'd that's have them. Yeah. How that would work. Uh, there's got to be a better way to do that. I mean, I guess the idea is that even if you're getting less per stream, at that point you're benefiting musicians better overall by streaming more music because you're divvying up the pie among more people. Uh, and the way you make more money is reaching more people in that case, not kind of trying to control how they stream. Yeah. Well, uh, yes, don't listen to us, music industry. Keep things the way they are, but but maybe give a higher yeah. percentage to, to the to the musicians. Labels could... could uh, give a little higher percentage to the musicians too. In Android, when you select no in the location history setting, that means the operating system no longer logs your location. But it does not mean that websites and apps might not get that data unless you turn off the web and app activity setting. The location setting, which is in a very easy to find area of settings called location. You know, you tap into settings, location, you're there. Uh, says it may use sources like GPS, Wi-Fi, mobile networks, and sensors to estimate your device's location. Google may collect location data periodically and use this data in an anonymous way to improve location accuracy and location-based services. So far, so good. Easy to find setting, clear what it does. The web and app activity setting, however, is buried deep in the Google account settings it says it saves your activity on Google Sites and apps, including associated info like location, to give you faster searches, better recommendations, and more personalized experiences in Maps, Search, and other Google services. What this means is when you turn off location in that easy-to-find setting, your Google Search app or going to Google.com may still keep some location info on you unless you turn off the web and app activity setting deep in your Google account settings. Now, to many users, including me, that actually seems logical. Like, I don't like that it's buried so far, but I get it. Turning off an OS setting doesn't block an app or a website from accessing things like your IP address, right? They're, they're doing it for different reasons. But the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission decided that even if it confused just some users, it is a violation of consumer law, so the commission sued, and the judge agreed. Friday, Federal Court of Australia Justice Thomas Thalley ruled that Google partially misled Australian consumers. Justice Thalley ruled that while the practice would not mislead all reasonable users, it was likely to mislead some reasonable users, since there was no reference to location info in the web and activity setting at the time that the lawsuit was taking place. Google is considering an appeal of this. Peter Lewis from the Australia Institute uh, think tank told The Guardian, quote, the problem here is you need a university education and it takes an average of 74 minutes to read most terms and conditions. <laughs> I found that quote particularly apt here, which is like, it actually took me like 20 minutes this afternoon to go find that web and app activity setting and understand exactly how it differed from the other location setting. Wow. So, so what does the the lawsuit make Google do? Uh, are they compelled to make it easier to find? Yes. Are they fined money? They have to. For they have it? to either explain what's happening and say this doesn't turn off all location. There's also these other places, mm -hmm. uh, or they have to make it turn off all location. But they, they they have to mend their ways. And yeah, I'm not sure if that there's a fine involved as well. I mean, I think that the the 
the issue, the main issue is that the web and activity is buried to the point where it does seem like Google's trying to not let people find this because you really have to go looking for it. Whether or not that's true, I mean, it just kind of depends on how you are with settings panels, you know, in a variety of places. And I think most of the people listening to DTNS would say, well, I know the difference between the two of these. This this seems like, you know, I mean, who's really getting all that confused? We all know plenty of people who would, so who say, well, hold on a second. At the OS level, if I turn the setting off, how does that not affect everything on this device that I am then using from that point forward? And, you know, that's something that is, it, it's good to remember that there are a lot of people that this would confuse. You know, you know, I think Google can probably just make some settings changes, add a few words here and there, and everybody's happier. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a good reminder. Yeah, I'm not sure they're malicious here. I just think Google thinks like engineers. They, they always have an Android, and they always have an, their things. It, it's, it makes sense for tech heads and for engineers, but it doesn't make sense for consumers. Right. Right? I think that's the bottom line here. No, I, I think you're absolutely right, because an yeah. engineer is going to say, like, well, I'm not going to turn off location settings for the browser in the operating system uh, area. That doesn't make any sense. What if you're in, logged into the browser on another device? Like, I'm going right. to have now I'm going to have to be able to tell when you're on this device versus that device. It's way too complicated. Uh, but, yeah, I totally get and I know people who are like, mm -hmm. yeah, but it says location. So when I turn it off, it should turn off all the location, right? Exactly. Yeah, like it's yeah. your master setting, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And in many ways, it, it is for some things. But uh, but yeah, diff the browser different ways it's... of conceiving of it. Yeah. Exactly. Amazon is rolling out the ability to set a Kindle's lock screen wallpaper to show the cover of the book, magazine, comic, or manga. A manga, sorry, excuse me, <laughs> currently being read. The display cover setting is coming to non-ad supported standard Kindles, as well as Paperwhite, Oasis, and Voice devices. You can turn it on by enabling the show cover option under device settings, uh, excuse me, device options in settings. You could previously do this if you jailbroke your Kindle. Now, Tom and uh, uh, Sarah, when I first saw this, uh, I was like, why is this a story? But then I realized, well, I'm not a Kindle user. So that right there. But even in my head, I was like, is this really a thing that people are asking for? And I think, Tom, you had a very, very quick answer to me. Yeah. <laughs> when uh, I, when I said that. Well, the is, yeah, they do. Uh, yeah. But I, I, I don't know. I don't really use a, a single purpose Kindle device anymore. Uh, so this isn't going to help me. But I don't know how many times I've forgotten the name of the book I'm reading because I never see the cover of it. Usually, you know, as soon as you put a book down, you see the cover and you're reminded of the name and the author right away. That doesn't happen uh, when you're doing an ebook, and but now it can, and it makes perfect sense to me. Like, why are you showing me a picture of Ernest Hemingway when I turn off my Kindle? Show me the book I'm reading right then. I I like the idea that you can not you can have leave this off if you don't want people to know. If you're like, no, no, I, I want to keep what I'm reading secret because maybe I'm a little embarrassed or whatever. Uh, but I think there are a lot of people that are like, yeah, no, I I want to see that because there's that cue when I pick it up of like, oh, I'm I am reading this book now. Wait, so real quick, is when you when your Kindle is sitting idle because I haven't used one in years. Is it always showing the, the the cover or is it blank? Because it, no, it shows other things. It doesn't ever show the cover. Oh, now I mean before. Will. So, but it, it was showing something. It wasn't just yeah, a blank yeah. Screen. It would show. It would oh, show. Like, okay. The original Kindle showed like pictures of all great authors, right? Okay. Now, now, now uh, this makes sense a little bit more to yeah. me because then you say, oh yeah, that's that's the book or whatever because you can see it. Because I'm thinking if you pick it up and turn it on, it's just going to go back to where you left off. But I see, I see the point now. This is sense. when it's, yeah, when it's when it's resting because it's got the e-ink screen. It can just leave a picture up there, and it doesn't use any battery life. Got it. I've never owned a Kindle, uh, not for any good reason. I just never had one. I guess it's sort of then the iPad came out, and I was like, oh, I could just read stuff on the iPad. Uh, so I never actually, yes, had the kind of standalone reading device that was the Kindle. I was shocked to learn that this wasn't already a feature. Uh, it seems really obvious that people would want this. I know for, for myself, I, I don't buy a whole lot of dead tree books anymore, but the, and, and the book is, you know, don't judge it by its cover. Ha ha. But a great cover is something that is, you know, intrinsically connected to the book. 
You know, you, you, you always remember that cover of a book that you've been reading and you pick up and you put down a bunch of times and you, you know, you do your little notch in your, in your page to know where you are and you look at the cover a lot. So to have that same experience with the Kindle and not have to, you know, keep buying lots of bookshelves for your books makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. Now you can yeah. judge your Kindle by the cover that shows there up. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and DSpace9 uh, wanted to point out, Lamar mentioned that this is for non-ad supported Kindles. If you've got a Kindle that is ad supported, mm -hmm. ads show up when you turn it off. You can call Amazon and pay to have the ads turned off and get this feature. Some people say if you beg, some, sometimes they'll turn off the ad feature even without you paying, but your mileage may vary. Oh. We're doing a crossover show this weekend, folks. Very excited. This week in science and daily tech news show meshing together. This daily week tech in news science show. It's happening Saturday, April 17th at 7 p.m. Pacific or 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, it's me, Sarah and Roger, along with Dr. Kiki, Blair and Justin from Twiss. Uh, and we have been soliciting topics from you Thank you for those. We will be attending to those topics and talking about a bunch of them on the show. Again, this Saturday, April 17th, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Watch live at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. The Project Connected Home Over IP program, or more easily remembered as CHIP, is supported by Apple, Amazon, Google, and a total of 180 companies providing a unified standard for smart home products. The idea is that you don't have to check if your product is going to use Zigbee or Z-Wave or worry if it works with your Echo or your Home or your HomePod. Everything in the CHIP Alliance works with everything else in the CHIP Alliance. The CHIP standard supports Bluetooth LE for setup, Ethernet, and Wi-Fi for high bandwidth stuff like your security cameras, and Thread the mesh protocol for low bandwidth stuff. Uh, you know, motion sensors, water sensors, stuff like that. Apple HomePod Mini, Google Nest Hub, and Eero all support Thread already, and older products can become chip compliant through a bridge, either with a firmware upgrade, or in some cases, you might have to buy a new bridge. But what you really want is brand new stuff that's chip compliant out of the box, and we're headed towards that world finally. According to a Zigbee Alliance webinar, members of chip will be able to get their devices certified for the chip standard by the end of this year. That means by the holidays, you may be able to buy chip compliant lighting, blinds, HVAC controls, you know, heating and air conditioning, TVs, door locks, garage door openers, security systems, Wi-Fi routers, and more. Keep in mind, chip does not handle device to cloud communication. So you will still need a device's apps for some integrations. Uh, chip certification, we got some more details in this webinar as well, requires AES 128-bit encryption, so devices in the Chip Alliance will be more secure. Uh, Over-the-air updates are required, so you won't have to go plug something in. Uh, it makes it easier mm. to update it. And they're going to run a blockchain to certify device identity and track security updates. Stacey Higginbotham noted that the standard still needs to clear up how apps will work since Phones aren't likely to be chip certified because they leave your home. Uh, also of interest is how homes with multiple smart assistants might work. So there's still some details to come, but this is a very promising move towards interoperability. Yeah, I, oh my God, I <laughs> I saw this. I was like, yes, finally. I just had an experience where I, I, I had to change a couple of light switches that I need for like automation for sunset, sunrise, for some lights to come on. And you know it was it was a pain in the butt because I wanted to connect it to my security system and so okay so that's Z-Wave but but oh no it's Z-Wave Plus and then I have an iPhone and then I have a HomePod but it doesn't work with the HomePod so I need to get a Amazon uh, Echo because that that connects to it but I don't use it is was driving me crazy and and, mm -hmm. and so and, and I know I'm not the only one who's dealt with this so seeing something like this a standard not going to be immediate that's going to come but eventually where you just buy something. And it just works. And you and just know it's going to work. Yeah, I yeah. was setting up a new LifeX bulb the other day, and it kept wanting to put itself on the home kit. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm using Echo for this stuff. And I, I really <laughs> would like it just all to work together so it didn't matter, right? Like, yeah, yeah. just set up and show up on, on all the devices I have, no matter what. I've kind of got the opposite problem of you, Lamar, where everything mm -hmm. that I can think of that's smart is 
a Zigbee compatible product, mm -hmm. but that also influences my buying choices. Cause I'm like, I don't want to get weird here. Let's just make sure it's Zigbee. And that's, you know, that's how yeah. I know I don't break, break my house. And so this <laughs> yeah. will be able to open yeah. up a lot of other product ideas to me that I just have never even paid attention to before, because it's like, yeah, you gotta have it all in one system where it gets really weird. Cause it kind of yeah. gets weird anyway. So yeah. Yeah. I, I know we had like what Samsung has tried to, do the smart things to try right. uh, we Waymo, you know, there's been some ones to try to, and that, that's just, that still gets overly confusing. And, and so here's to hoping this, this becomes uh, a thing quickly. Yeah. I mean, the fact that they have everybody on board is the biggest advantage this has over previous efforts. Mm -hmm. They still need to work out some of the details uh, on it. But to me, that's, that's a better place than we've ever been regarding that stuff. Exactly. But speaking of security and Internet of Things, we got another story here. We do. The Internet of Secure Things Alliance, or IOXT, has expanded its certifications for IoT devices to include mobile apps and VPNs. Criteria for certification was developed by security labs and testing vendors like NCC Group and Now Secure, as well as Google and Amazon. Now, to get certification, a mobile app has to have secure interfaces, automatic updates, secure password management, security by default vulnerab vulnerability reporting programs, end-of-life policies, and more. Now, VPS, or actually VPNs, let's try that, must uh, pass these tests and also test for data leak leakage, automatic reconnects and kill switch functions, and checks for TLS intercepts and script injections. Uh, my tongue is acting up today, sorry. <laughs> the first apps certified under the new program are... Uh, Ferrell's Hub Space from the Home Depot, uh, Leviton Green Max DRC, and Comcast Xfinity Authenticator. Now, the first certified VPNs are Google One, uh, ExpressVPN, NordVPN, McAfee Innovations, OpenVPN for Android, Private Internet Access VPN, and VPN Private. I feel like I've done brand deals for like half of those VPNs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you you and a bunch of the rest of the internet. Uh, yeah, I yeah. use ExpressVPN myself, and I've had an open VPN uh, through Private Tunnel for a long time, so I was happy to see both of those on there. Obviously, a lot yeah. of people using Google One and Nord and McAfee. Uh, I'm not as familiar with Private Internet Access or VPN Private, uh, but I'm sure we're going to get more added to that list as well uh, as it goes along. This, this is a this is another good standards organization expanding what it does to say like, sure, good to certify the devices. We also shouldn't leave out the apps. I think that's incredibly important to say like, oh yeah, if you got this Home Depot app, like Home Depot, did did they just like get some off the shelf stuff? Is it janky? Who, who's running it? It's like, no, okay, good. I, I know that a Pharaoh's hub space is certified uh, by the IOXT. That gives me a little more confidence. Good stuff. Yeah. I have a. Uh, I was having a conversation yesterday with a, with a friend about VPNs. Ironically, and we had this story, and th there was some hesitation because he's trying to be, you know, more private. And and I was saying, well, yeah, you, you know, does a, does a VPN block your ISP? You know, for ISP from seeing stuff. And we we're kind of discussing that. But but then yeah, it just came up that hey, how do we know these VPNs are safe? I mean, how do we know they're not, you know, doing doing certain things with your, with your data? So it's nice to see there are some, you know, it's not perfect, right? You know, you still don't fully know, but it's just good to know there's some certification in place because VPNs are becoming more commonplace. People are hearing about, I just mentioned, you know, people do ads on them, you know, so people are hearing about these things. And it's, I guess it's important to have some baseline certification on these so people can feel that they're safe in some way. Yeah, there's been some good projects out there uh, to to try to review VPNs and audit them. There's a VPN audit pro pro program out there that's really good. Uh, even outlets like PC World, PC Mag, uh, do good reviews of this. So, so you know, adding another certification, kind of an independent certification to the pile is is definitely helpful. And this seems like a very thorough one as well. I, I obviously want to make sure that they get audited, but. The ones that got certified off the top give me a good indication of like, oh, yes, I have seen those also audited by others and pass muster. Mm. So they've got they've got the right names in there, uh, at least at the beginning. Yep. Well, who likes sneakers here? 
Yep. Who does it? Me. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. That's a good <laughs> answer because Adidas announced the Stan Smith Milo concept sneaker, that's M-Y-L-O, Milo, which uses renewable materials across most of the shoe, including an upper section made from Milo material, which comes from root-like structure of mushrooms grown in a vertical farm in, you guessed it, the Netherlands. Adidas worked with the startup Bolt Threads on the material and hopes to have a version of the shoe for sale within the next 12 months. Milo isn't the only plant-based leather, though. Mycoworks uses mushrooms to create reishis. It's a kind of mushroom. Used in a concept bag from Hermes. And Fossil is selling totes made from cactus leather. Yeah, uh, this Engadget story is fascinating uh, because it just went into all the technology that is needed to replace animal leather, right? Leather made from, from animal skins uh, and make it quality, make it uh, fit, make it work as a material, not, not have it be inferior. And, and there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into it, uh, but a lot of people motivated to do it. When I first read the story, I misread it and I was like, Adidas is like going to sell the first mushroom shoe. It's actually, <laughs> th this technology does exist. Other companies, smaller companies, I mean, not Adidas size uh, companies, you know, one of the biggest shoemakers in the world um, ha have experimented with this. Um, it, it's, it's a material that I think is, is growing in sort of sustainability popularity. And yeah, I'm into it. I'm totally into it. Listen, I, I, I like leather. I like the look of leather. I like a leather shoe. If it's made of mushrooms, okay, I'm in. I, I think it's like you said in pre-show, like just mushrooms and feet, though, when I think of those two things. <laughs> you have to get past that part. Yeah, you have to get do. past that. And I think yeah. Be okay. You have, to, so, you have to read through all of this about how they tan, you know, and compress and change the mushroom because the idea of right. just wearing straight mushrooms on your feet, probably not as appealing. Yeah. A lot of things <laughs> happened, but, you know, from yeah. the cremini mushroom to the shoe <laughs> right. from Stan Smith that you're, you know, you're not just slapping now. a portabella on your ankle. I, I was going to say, are, are these big, because I like the baby Bella ones myself personally. Yeah. Really well, they, they go between your toes. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, the shiitake shoes, very pricey. Very by pricey. the way, by the way, Adidas will not be the first to bring uh, a Milo product uh, to market. Uh, the, as Sarah said, she'll, they'll be the biggest, but Stella McCartney. Stella McCartney getting that uh, getting that first product out there. So there you go. Okay. Well, Stella McCartney has a a, a, a a partnership with Adidas. Yeah. Um, McCartney's Fashion House will be the first to bring a name, followed by Adidas. Then um, uh, Lululemon is going to mm. put out some stuff. Uh, and mushroom, then uh, mushroom at the uh, Soul Cycle. Uh, lemon mushroom. I mean, could they go go together? Nice. <laughs> Nice vinaigrette. No. <laughs> right no, come on. They, they can. They can. You can make yeah. it work. Uh, and then apparently uh, Keering, a holding company that owns Gucci and St. Laurent and all, all those kind of fancy brands like that, uh, is going to do this too. So we're not seeing any of this stuff yet, like Sarah what said. Say Keurig. But yeah, no. <laughs> For your mushroom <laughs> coffee, that's a little farther down the road. Yeah. All yeah. right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, David from sunny and not yet hot Phoenix wrote in and said, your discussion about time protection really hit me. David is referencing uh, the conversation that we had uh, yesterday about, about uh, laws that could be put into place so that employers couldn't bug employees after the employees were kind of done with work for the day. David says, I was a brand new system admin for a large company back in 2004. I worked from home for many years. I had a realization a year or two in that neither my boss nor my company was going to protect my time, so I had to do it. I started really setting up those boundaries for work and personal and family time. Even if laws are passed, and even if a company means well, you still have to take control of your time. No amount of laws will make you control your time better. It is up to you. David says, I understand the pressure that people feel, but your mental and physical health is at stake if you don't do it, and no amount of money can buy your time back. A big amen for me on this one. I didn't. I didn't get a chance to hear that uh, yesterday, but I've worked for like 15 years from, um, you know, working for myself, and uh, yeah, the the res the, re the time respect does not exist if, unless you control it yourself. So, uh, I'm aim amen to David on this one. Agreed. Well, if you have yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
I know. It's like, <laughs> yeah, we all shouldn't work ourselves to death. It seems so easy, right? Uh, in theory. Uh, if you have feedback or anything that we've talked about on our show, something that we might talk about on a future show, question, comments, all that good stuff, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to direct it to us. We read each and every email we get. So thank you in advance and keep them coming. Also, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today, they include Jeffrey Zilks, Steve Iadarola, and Michelle Sergio. Also, thanks to our brand new boss, Benjamin Yeager. Yay, Benjamin, who just started backing us on mm -hmm. Patreon. Welcome, and thank you very much, new boss. Well, Len Peralta has been busy drawing uh, today based on at least one of the stories in our lineup. Len, what have you drawn for us today? You know, I know Sarah said that Adidas isn't the first place to do these shoes, but I'm going to say, yeah, it's pretty cool. They're, this, you know, they're, and I have, a, I have a name for them. I'd like to call them the mush shoes, you know, <laughs> because I think that's, uh, that's like the new brand thing, right? And I got to say, one person in the mushroom kingdom has got to be very happy that there are mushroom shoes out there. It's the mushroom dude from Super Mario who I drew for this thing. Very cool. It's fun. Uh, this is available right now at my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Len. Also at my online store at lenperaltastore.com. And uh, it's also available at OpenSea.io uh, as an NFT. And you can get the, the sketches of all this stuff as unlockables if you get them there. So check it all out. That's that's and I'm getting I'm going out to get my mush shoes now. So, yeah, complete the I whole look. I love that you have to call him mushroom dude for protection purposes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll leave it at that. You know, it's the mushroom dude. Mushroom yeah, yeah. dude. You know, yeah. you know, you know who I mean. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when I say Lamar Wilson, you also know what we mean. Lamar Wilson, thank you for being with us this Yay. fine Friday. Ah, TGIF yeah. indeed. Let folks know what you've been up to lately. I've been kind of on a hiatus, but I'm working on a, a project with a, a streaming service. Uh, hopefully it'll be out next week, and I'll be showing some classic uh, or, or some evergreen shows that, that I love watching or movies. So if you want to check that, you know, that out, I'm on YouTube, youtube.com slash Lamar Wilson. That should be out sometime next week. Excellent. Well, hey. it's been a lovely week here on DTNS, and a reminder that we're live Monday through Friday, all the days, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more, tell a friend, dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're also back Monday, and we'll be joined by Tim Stevens. We'll probably be talking about cars. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show was created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Limos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Social media producer, Shannon Morse. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott is one. Zoe Brings Bacon, BioCow, Captain Kipper, and Jack Shid. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed from Sean Way. Music provided by Martin Bell and Dan Luters. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Stefan Brown. Contributors for this week's show include Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Lamar Wilson. Guests on this week's show included Seth Rosenblatt and Ayaz Akhtar. Live art performed by Len Peralta. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Private Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>